Bush did. But at the end of the day, he signed the bill that says you can't bring a detainee uh, from Guantanamo to the U.S. or transfer them to the, another country without notifying Congress in advance. Yep. Let, let me just say, the problem on that is it's subtle, too. Most people in the country believe Guantanamo is full of terrorists. Even though, so the word has not gotten out who they are, the people have been clear. In that context, there are a number of, of, of members of Congress who play to that fear and hysteria by saying, we're going to stand up and protect our constituents so we won't let them in the United States or somewhere else. Uh, so the way to oppose it, you know, you've got to oppose it by saying that they're wrong. There's got to be a, a thing. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to veto the bill. You've got to work earlier and, and take it on. In the context when you're fighting over the fiscal cliff and other things, it, you know, the administration doesn't want to take it on, the Democratic Party doesn't want to take it on, the Republican Party doesn't even want to take on their crazy people. So the restrictions are in there. It needs to be a long-term plan of how you, you stop them from being in there, how you, you work this out. So. The, the 86 people who've been cleared for release, perhaps there's a little more detail about who these very sober officials recommend, approve these prisoners to transfer out to Guantanamo. Surely the, all that is required is the most minimal kind of supervision. Mm -hmm. It's not the suggestion that they should go from one prison to another. It's that they should, be, they should be released. Now, you know, I think primarily because lawyers are involved, and I'm sure Tom can confirm this, it isn't just for, for reasons of security that they approve people for transfer rather than actually saying cleared for release. You know, let them go, let them go free. It's that lawyers are saying, don't ever admit any kind of responsibility. Well, you want to put your head then, then we'll get sued. Um, that these people are not dangerous. That's the, that's what I mean, we're actually, when you ask that question, I'm having to calibrate the, their dangerousness. The, the task force would not have approved them to go if we were not talking about people who were insignificant. Yeah. So what, what is the stumbling block on the, on the Yemenis in particular? Well, there, there are two stumbling blocks. Uh, the fear is that Yemen is unstable. So if, you know, it's more a political stumbling block. So if you release them, let me stand back. Mo is right. Other than the 15 to 30 people who may be dangerous, everyone agrees. These other people are nothing. I mean, even if they fought against us in Afghanistan 12 years, they're nothing. So they're really not dangerous people, these other people. I, I, I mean, and you've talked to Olson, and they say they're, they're basically nothing people. So what is the stumbling block? The fear is that Yemen is unstable, uh, that one of these people can get out. The Republicans in Congress are going to give them terrible hell and use it as political hay. That's more it. One of the reasons, I, some of these people could really be released in the United States if Congress weren't yelling around and saying, oh my God, they're dangerous. Don't let, don't let them near our, our children. You know, they've said that. People have said that even for people who everyone admits are, are innocent, like the Uyghurs. Everybody says these are innocent people. Congress will let Uyghurs into the United States. So the stumbling block is myriad. It's Yemen is unstable. We don't want people in the United States. If we don't let them in the United States, we go to other countries and say, well, if you don't take them in, why should we take them in? So, you know, it's, it's a stepping stone system. Five years ago, you know, when more people cared and there was more criticism because it was President Bush and, 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 and criticism had kind of percolated through globally and, and even domestically that something was deeply wrong. And there was a lot of criticism. President Bush, you know, was releasing prisoners. There, was, there wasn't... The, the questions that we have now of, you know, starting from a point of view of it seems to be very, very deeply unsafe to even release anyone, you know, and the most massive case has to be made for the release of anybody. So we've ended up with this extraordinary situation where cleared prisoners are held, which is, I keep repeating, it's so deeply unacceptable. But, you know, it was almost easy for prisoners to be released five years ago. We're not fundamentally talking about different people. You know, as, because uh, around half of the cleared prisoners were cleared for release under President Bush, but he didn't get around to releasing them at the time, because many of them were Yemenis, and because this Yemeni issue has persistently been there. If, you're, if your nationality is Saudi, um, it became, at, at a certain point, quite easy to get out of Guantanamo, because uh, the United States has a much closer relationship with the Saudi Arabia, and, and negotiations were undertaken on that basis. So the Yemenis have always suffered. Um, 
but you know, it's really, it's really not acceptable, is it, that we have, we can all agree, there are a few dozen Yemenis that everyone who has studied their cases has said, look, these appear to be quite dangerous people, so we're going to have to be very careful with these, and, and hopefully we can put most of them on trial. For the clear prisoners to end up being the same, being treated the same, that's just wrong. So we need to be able to make the case that the people who are, who are pretty insignificant really are, that's it. Don't worry about it. Let's not crank up the hysteria and the fear, because that's what's been happening. Since President Obama made his announcement to close Guantanamo and then didn't follow up and hasn't taken the lead, we've had people filling that vacuum whose, whose mission is one of stirring up fear, and that mostly, I think, has been for their own personal political motives, not because they genuinely believe it. No one's in charge. You know, one of the, I don't know, I think I, I think I mentioned this last year, so it's been, been that long, but I was driving and I heard on, on NPR, I, I turned on the radio and there was a story about this, somebody being in prison in Cuba and uh, it was unfair. And I thought it was going to be a story, yeah, I thought it was going to be a story about Guantanamo. And it was about Alan Gross, who's an American citizen in prison in Cuba. And our government is really good about if it's an Alan Gross or uh, Amir Hikmati was the uh, American that the Iranians uh, were going to put on trial in Iran or the hikers that were picked up or the people that were North Korea. You know, we're really good about, you know, how dare you hold an American citizen and insisting that, you know, it's you know, a violation of the rule of law and you, you can't do this. Yet, we've got people that have spent more than a decade in prison because of their citizenship. You know, that we have said did not commit a crime. They, they're, they're not here to be punished. They're here because of their citizenship. And I would imagine the public, you know, the, the, the right-wing, you know, airbags that are on the radio and television would be pitching a fit if Americans were being held because of their citizenship year after year after year in another country. But, you know, we're supposed to be you know, American exceptionalism, that, which apparently creates an exception when we do things that we condemn others for doing, which is just fundamentally wrong. This gentleman here, if you wait for the microphone, just... <laughs> I'm Eric Curtis. Um, I litigated the case on behalf of the British detainees, uh, civil torture um, and religious abuse case. Um, I'd like to ask you about next year with the withdrawal of all troops and the end of combat operations in Afghanistan, what is your view on the basis under the law of war for continuing to hold without uh, detention or trial the people who are left at Guantanamo? And, and just, so just to add to that, so it is potentially an opportunity for Congress to revisit the authorization for the use of military force, which most Congress people, when they voted probably didn't think was going to last for 12, 13 years. Is there any chance that there might be a, a modified authorization once combat troops leave Afghanistan? Um, I, well, I think there is. The question is, as Rick is pointing out, there's really no authorization to hold people in a combat situation. You could take troops up and hold them till the end of the battle, and the purpose is not the punishment, but to keep them out of the battle. If the battle is over, I would say Congress would have no right uh, to even authorize their own. That's going to be an argument, and, and the argument for most of the people being held is that, that, that we are in a combat. Now, the government will argue they were really picked up in the continuing war on terror. I think, you know, this is technical. I don't think the Hamdi case which authorizes detention, authorizes holding people in a continual war of terror. They say uh, it's really, at least that case was decided on picking, it was an American citizen, but picking somebody up in the context of the particular combat that's going on. So, and this is confusing for people, but if the war is over and you can't hold people as, you know, purported prisoners of war. It was encouraging. I think Jay Johnson, who is the mm -hmm. general counsel for the Department of Defense, who unfortunately is leaving to go back into to private practice, who, in my opinion, is, is a, a person I've got a lot of respect for, he gave a talk, I think at Oxford, somewhere in, in England recently, where he, he, he didn't go into great detail on this, but 
suggested the same thing, that, you know, that this war is winding down. And when it does, the legal justification that we've used to detain these people likely goes away when the, when the war winds down. Wouldn't it also take away the legal justification for drone strikes outside a war zone in terms of out of, out of a convention? I mean, well, that's another issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what what is the answer? You know, I'll let somebody else answer it because I I tried as we did last year to try to keep the drones away from this issue. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I, I'm terribly troubled by it. I think there are good arguments. Can't do it, but I, I'm, I, but one isn't contingent on the other. I want to get Guantanamo closed. But, 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 so we have two lawyers here. The, the authorization for the use of military force is that the underlying legal rationale for the use of drone strikes in places like no. Yemen? No. I, I think it's well, again. I think you have to keep in mind there are two drone programs. I right. think for the military program and the kill list that goes with that program, that yes, it's based on. You know, we're at war, and you can combatants can kill the enemy, even if they're unlawful, you know, deemed unlawful enemy combatants. I think it's much harder to make that argument on the CIA. I mean, like you said, it's the authorization for the use of military force. I, okay, I, I maybe can I rephrase it? I'm not asking if it's completely legally kosher in your own minds. So I'm asking, is that the legal basis under which the administration, both whether it's Bush or Obama, authorizes the use of CIA drone strikes. We don't know for sure because they won't tell us. <laughs> but at least from what they have said, because you know, in the ACLU lawsuit trying to get the legal justification, you know, the government's argument is that the government has never officially acknowledged that we have a drone program. Even the though they... The president's given interviews now, so it's... Well, that... <laughs> but they're saying they've never officially, even though they talk about it and they, you know, crow about the success of the, you know, they said the government has never officially acknowledged that we have a, a drone program. But the argument in like Somalia and Yemen and uh, uh, Pakistan has been that we have the, you know, the, the consent of the government to hunt down bad guys and kill them because it benefits us and, and them as well. So I don't know that the law of war is the rationale, legal rationale for, for those stories. There's a distinction. Uh, you know, I think the government can make a strong argument based on the commander in chief's power under the Constitution that he has right to take action to protect the United States. It's a slippery slope, and you see how far it goes. And that's independent of, uh, of the uh, authorization for the use of military force. The authorization of the uh, passage by Congress of something authorizing them makes his power stronger. Just as Jackson said, when you have Congress and the President together, it's hard to do it. But I think they can argue under the Constitution. One of the differences is the right to detain people is always something that's been covered, I mean, it's aside from going and killing them. The right to detain people has always been something more in the judicial branch and covered by judicial review and the law. So they, you may have more right to use force than you do to detain people, the government. I think the, with the AUMF or the constitutional authority, those are great shields you know, for a domestic criminal prosecution, but the Constitution or the AUMF can create international law. And when we're acting, killing people in Yemen or Pakistan or Somalia or other foreign countries, the Constitution and whatever acts of Congress you know, have been passed or irrelevant. Killing people in Yemen or Pakistan or Somalia or other foreign countries, the Constitution and whatever acts of Congress, you know, have been passed or irrelevant.